So it's really only towards the end of the 19th century and in about uh, 1897, in fact, when a guy called J.J. Thompson found that inside the atom, uh, it was actually made out of subatomic particles. And he discovered the electron, so really just over 100 years ago. Uh, and it, this work here led on to some other work that various scientists did. Uh, and there's a couple of scientists called Millikan and Fletcher. Now, Professor Millikan wanted to look and actually study the charge on an individual electron. Uh, but it wasn't just him doing the work, although he gets all the credit. Uh, there's also a guy called Fletcher, who was actually a PhD student at the time. Uh, and although he wasn't really credited in the work, I think uh, Millikan sort of helped his career later on. And basically, uh, he used a, a device that is, is quite useful to think about, and it's to do with uh, the motion of charged particles within an electric field. So how did Millikan and Fletcher do it? Well, they used a device a bit like this. Now, this is very much just a cross-section of this kind of chamber where they uh, actually looked at the motion of particles within an electric field. And basically, what we have is this yellow plate here represents my positive electric plate. And the one at the bottom is negative. And uh, between these plates, this is where we actually study things. And in order to study things which are very small, they used a microscope. So this part here is just going to represent my microscope, which is looking into the chamber down here. But in order to see inside what is actually a dark chamber, because it's all sealed off from the air, uh, what we have is a light source, which is quite hard to represent in Lego. So effectively, we've got a light source which is shining down here. Uh, and this would illuminate anything inside this darkened part of the chamber. And what they really investigated inside this was a load of oil droplets. So these are my little droplets of oil. And in order to get these inside this, they used, uh, basically, this is my oil bottle here, with an atomizer. Now, an atomizer, when you spray it, it just sends a very fine mist of oil into the air inside. So if I just connect that up over here. So what they did, they fired a very fine mist of droplets into the chamber, and, uh, and the friction here caused some of them to become charged. They also uh, used, uh, I think, an X-ray source, and this also uh, basically ionised uh, the oil droplets inside. So here I have my oil droplets which uh, fall down here due to gravity. Now the thing is the top plate here actually had a hole in it and that meant some of these droplets could actually fall uh, between these plates. And what they did uh, by making various measurements on these charged droplets here, they actually worked out uh, the smallest unit of charge that we have. And that's what this video is really all about and it explains it in a little bit more detail. Now the region in this I'd really like to concentrate on is this uh, region where we can have an electric field and some particles inside it. So what I'd like to do is just look at that in a bit more detail. So here we have this region where we have this electric field. So in the experiment they let uh, very small drops of charged oil fall between these plates and then they turned on uh, the field and basically the top plate was positive uh, and that meant uh, these negatively charged particles would be attracted towards the top plate. Now, if they made the field too strong, they'd start to move up. If it wasn't strong enough, they'd move back down. And what they managed to do was adjust the, the potential difference between the two plates to be just right. And at this point, the drops were basically not moving up or down, and therefore they were in equilibrium. Now, if we think about the forces that might be on one of these drops, well, there's going to be two forces that we can consider when it's, when it's not moving. First of all, there's going to be a downwards force, and there's also going to be a force upwards. And I'm going to label the downwards force Fg to represent the force due to gravity. And the force upwards uh, is due to the electric field, so I'm going to call that Fe. Now this force upwards, Fe, uh, is due to the fact that we have an electric field and this is uh, acting on a charged particle. And the force is equal to the strength of the electric field, E, multiplied by the charge on uh, the oil drop that we have here. Um, however, we also know that, uh, well, how do we work out um, the charge in the electric field? Well, E is equal to V over D. If we know the strength of the potential difference and we know the distance between the plates, we can work out the electric field strength. And therefore, this force is equal to VQ over D. And that tells us then uh, the size of that force upwards. We know V, we know D, but we're not quite sure about Q, but that's what we're looking for in this experiment. So what about the force downwards? Well, Fg, the force due to gravity, is caused by the weight of the object, and the weight of an object is equal to its mass times the gravitational field strength. So how do we know the mass of one of these objects? Well, the mass of something is equal to its density times the volume, and we can actually find out the density of these oil droplets by measuring a large quantity of oil. So this is something that we know. 
How do you find the volume though? Uh, and here V is volume, whereas here V was potential difference. Well, the volume of anything which is uh, a sphere, and that's what we're going to assume that these are nice spherical drops, is equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed. So this means we can say that the force due to gravity is equal to rho times 4 thirds pi r cubed multiplied by g. And if we know all of these factors here, we know these, it means we can then work out the charge on that, uh, that particle inside it. So because we know Fv is equal to Fg, what I can say is that Vq over d is equal to 4 thirds rho pi r cubed g. And if I rearrange this to make q the subject, we can say that q is equal to 4 thirds rho pi r cubed g d all divided by the potential difference between the plates. And if you know the density of the oil, if you know the gravitational field strength, the distance between the plates, the potential difference, uh, we know what pi is, and then we just need to find out what r cubed is. And uh, there are various ways that uh, you might see about this. It might say that you measure r directly, but it's very hard to actually get a very uh, accurate measurement of r. And this is something here that was a bit of a problem. And on the next uh, part of this video, I'm going to explain how they actually found out the value of r. So in order to measure the uh, charge of one of these oil droplets, they had to know the radius of this drop. And what they did was they uh, observed the oil as it fell due to gravity. So they turned the electric field off and using the graticules on uh, the actual uh, microscope, the little lines, they could tell how far one of these oil droplets uh, fell in a certain time. And what they then do, they then turn on the field so they get the same droplet to then move back up, up to the equilibrium position where it wasn't moving. So they let it fall at its terminal velocity. And at this point, we can then also consider the, the forces which are acting on this oil droplet. Again, when it's falling at terminal velocity, it's not getting faster or slower, and therefore the upwards force uh, due to the drag must be equal to the downwards force due to its weight. So once again, I'm just going to use Fg to be the downwards force due to weight, and then the upwards force uh, was due to drag, so I'm going to call that Fd. Now, uh, there's a thing called Stokes' Law that says for an object falling in a viscous fluid, so something which is sort of slightly sticky, perhaps like air, uh, Fd is equal to 6 pi eta rv, where eta is what we call the viscosity of the air. Now, viscosity is pretty much sort of how sticky it is, uh, how, uh, you know, what it, how much it resists the motion of objects, uh, and you think that something like water would be a lot greater than something like air. But nevertheless, air still has a drag coefficient. And uh, we can also think about r, the radius of the drop, and also the speed at which it's going. Basically, if something has a bigger radius, or a faster velocity, or in a more viscous fluid, then the drag force is going to be even bigger. So what they said was, uh, if we know that it's falling at a uniform at its terminal velocity, which is uh, what droplets get to really quickly when they're falling in its gravitational field, we can then equate the, this uh, drag force with the weight of that object. And this is what you should remember from uh, that last part of the video. So what we have now is the drag force and also the weight. Now what you can see here is that there's certain things that cancel. Uh, first of all, on both sides of the equation we have a pi, uh, and therefore we can get rid of that. And also we have r here and r cubed over here. So if I get rid of that r, this then becomes r squared. I can then rearrange it to make r squared the subject. So here we have r squared being equal to 9 over 2 eta v over rho g. Now again, uh, the viscosity of air is something that's known as is uh, the terminal velocity of that droplet, which can be measured by looking at the distance it's travelled in a certain amount of time. We also know the density of the oil, and we also know the gravitational field strength. So this means by knowing these factors, we can then work out the radius. Once you know the radius, we can then go back to the other part of the video. And then we have our value for R, which we, which we can use in this. So basically, you need to measure lots and lots of different things. You need to know the viscosity of air, the density of oil, the gravitational field strength, the distance between the plates, the potential difference, how fast it's moving, loads and loads of different things. And therefore, there are many, many sources of experimental error. But what was really important were the results that Millikan got. So what Millikan found was that when he measured the charge on all of these oil droplets, and again, I'm going to give the, the values here in coulombs, although he used a slightly different unit at the time, was he found that the, the charge in coulombs 
was always a certain multiple of a number. And what you found was that uh, there were droplets, some of them had a charge of 3.2 times 10 to the minus 19. Other ones might have had a value of 6.4 times 10 to the minus 19. Other ones had values of maybe 4.8. And also some of them had a very small value of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. But whatever value he found, it was always a multiple of this smallest number here. What he didn't find uh, with it, he didn't find that any of them were equal to things like sort of 1.5 times 10 to the minus 19, or maybe uh, 1.8. And this is really, really important. This means that uh, when we look at charge, it can't just be any number on this continuous spectrum. It has to be a certain quantity. And therefore, there's this quantized nature of this property called charge. And in actual fact, even though he did the experiment in 1913, so over 100 years ago, and there were so many errors that, he, that could have been introduced into the experiment, uh, the answer that he got was about 1.59 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, whereas nowadays we know that the answer is closer to 1.60 uh, times 10 to the minus 19. So actually his answer was very, very close. And it was in 1923 that he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work. So if you'd like to find out more about this kind of area, or if you'd like to have a look at the Year 13 work, please have a look at my other channel, which is the A-Level Physics Online Members area. And this has everything that you need for Year 13. So please have a look at it uh, and please subscribe to my videos on that channel as well. Thank you very much.